Hi, I'm Cliff Click. I uh, occasionally give talks about, you know, so, uh, uh, self-awareness for introverts, but I usually do this kind of stuff. This is our, uh, you know, this is a crash course in modern hardware. It's very funny because the word modern there has been on that slide for about a decade. Um, but hardware has slowed down, and so the, uh, the talk is still, uh, you know, pretty much spot on. I added some new slides for Spectre and Meltdown, and a whole bunch of people just walked in, so I'm going to stall while they find their seats, and, uh, and we'll get going here. Okay, so, so this is a, a, a short history of what it meant to be performant in microprocessors, uh, CPUs in general, for the last you know, 20, 30 years. And then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll head into what the hell goes on under the hood on an x86 um, and discover that it's inc incredibly complicated. And uh, just, just keep rolling on in. <laughs> I jumped the gun again. OK, fine. Um, yeah, oh, thank you very much. Da -da -da. OK, so well, let's just keep going here. So um, von Neumann architecture, this was you know, this notion that came around of what is a computer and what does it mean, and how does it work kind of thing, sort of in the very early days. And uh, you know, the, main, the main advantage was the program was kept in the same memory space as the data. So the program was data. You could hack it. You could load it and link it. You could do all kinds of fun stuff. Um, and then you know, the actual execution model is this very sequential, have an instruction, do it, get the next instruction, do it, get, do, get, do, get, do, right? Okay. Um, great model for understanding a computer. <coughs> great model for designing algorithms, especially back in the day when no one knew, you know, what quicksort was. Um, but that's not how computers work these days and not how they worked for quite a while. So it's a useful abstraction. Um, everyone probably gets one of these kind of discussions in high school, but it uh, hasn't been this way in a long time. So there is a you know, performance curve. I, I grabbed the first one off the interwebs, and I built the second one. Um, and it runs out to like 2016. And you can see that the you know, performance, single thread performance, is basically stalled for the past 20 years. Is that right? About 10, 12 years, something like that. <coughs> um, there's been modest gains. It's not like it hasn't happened at all. It's just that there's, a, there's some real limits we've hit. And instead, we've got more cores. So everyone becomes a parallel programmer and been that way for a while. OK, so the early machines, I'm going to say VAX was the, the exemplar here, were these very complicated instructions because they're intended to be programmed by humans. So it was handwriting assembly code because there were no compilers. So you, didn't, you couldn't ask the compiler to build stuff, right? OK, so they really fancy instructions, do all kind of weird things, whatever the hardware guys could throw in. Um, all kinds of complicated addressing modes for loads and stores which later turned out to be um, very difficult to make go fast. So this design style, which is sort of true of all chips, um, up to and including the original x86, uh, fell out of style in order to make things go faster. And that was because risk came along. So when we look at these instructions, um, th they had a, a, a typical fixed cycle count per instruction. So 4 to 10 kind of depend on the instruction. <coughs> Excuse me. Your pr program performance was actually related to the number of page faults. So memory was small. You ran off disk a lot. Um, and your instruction counts times you know, 4 to 10 or whatever it was. And for smaller systems, just page faults or just instruction counts. Um, page fault count was very easy to measure. The OS gave it to you. And managing the locality of your code and your data so you had fewer page faults was a key performance metric. And that notion will come around in a minute again and again and again, managing locality. Um, then we flipped over to the risk notion because it was easy to scale the speed of the thing. And so the processors got faster clock rate. They got faster and you know, fewer. Uh, um, cycles per instruction, you know, better pipelining. The, the instruction set became diff more difficult to code because at this point, people understood compilers actually worked. And so you could rely on a compiler, and a compiler didn't care about all kinds of weird ass things like delay slots and could just deal with delay slots, which are a pain in the butt for humans to deal with. Um, and so you got better compilers, and you got better code, and you got faster 
faster machines, and so things generally improved and kept improving for like 50% a year for like 15 years. This is like a huge exponential scale that happened there. And then we hit this wall about a decade ago, and the wall came in in a, in a variety of things, all of which taken together were insurmountable and remain basically so. The power wall is that the, the drain of power, the amount of energy it takes to make a transistor flip faster, rises cubically. So if you want to run your frequency 10% higher, you get 10% cubed more power consumption. And pretty soon you can't drain the power away fast enough, the heat away fast enough, the chip melts, right? And you had these comments about people about, to, you know, in 10 years the chips will glow like the surface of the sun. If you just do simple, you know, frequency scaling, you'll have to have nuclear reactors to power your chips and then they'll, they'll melt. Um, people had been doing for a long time, you know, ILPs, so instruction level uh, parallelism. People had been doing things to make instructions go faster without actually having them go faster. So pipelining was a big one. Branch prediction was a big one. Speculative execution was a big one. In taken in total, in combination, people discovered they could suddenly run a lot of instructions in every clock cycle and reliably, not just four to ten, but you know, four instructions per clock. And so that was one of the ways that sped up, and that quit getting better at somewhere around two to four instructions per clock, it no longer helped. The memory wall, that was basically related to speed of light. Memory is built with a different processor technology than the CPUs, uh, one that's designed for very regular, very dense structures. And, and that's why it's different. So they're different, which means that it's not on the same chip. It has to be done in a separate process, which means it's off chip, which means you have a space between the CPU and the memory on the motherboard, and that speed of light delay cannot be gotten around. And so memory is, as a minimum, some distance away in nanoseconds because that is the time it takes to take a signal, amplify it sufficiently that it'll actually get off the chip and through a couple inches of copper and then back on to the memory in, in, in the other way and back and forth it goes. And that is a minimum delay to memory. And that's, you know, memory didn't get any faster and you have to have it and suddenly you're, you're bottlenecked there too. Okay, so what, did, what happened here? So clock rates topped out, people couldn't go any faster, they couldn't get more speed out of more transistors to make fancier instruction level parallelism, they couldn't get more speed out of the memory with bigger caches. Um, so they got more cores instead of faster cores. And suddenly we got lots and lots of cores and we all learned how to become parallel programmers and we're still, I'll claim we're still trying to figure out how to write good parallel programs, but we have some technologies that we know and use, you know, thread pool level parallelism, stuff like that. Um, so I'm going to back up now and say, let's look at what happened with the instruction level parallelism. And um, it's kind of uh, instructive here because it tells us what, why Spectre and Meltdown appeared uh, uh, and where more of these kinds of attacks might show up. So what is instruction level parallelism? Um, it's a faster CPU at the same clock rate. It's multiple instructions getting issued in one clock rate, or it's pipeline, or branch protection, or whatever. There's a, there's a laundry list there, and I'll go through them in short order here. Um, I think people will get the, the gist of it. So internally, each instruction is done in multiple steps. So when you look at a, 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 an assembly level of instruction, it looks like load something from memory, add this to that, whatever. It's a very simple you know, recipe to do something. Uh, internally, however, it's always done in multiple parts. There's going to be fetch an instruction from memory, now probably in your cache. There's going to be decode, like is this a load instruction or an add or a multiply or whatever, you know, a branch. There is go get the operands. Those are the registers. They're kept off in a different data set that's different from the instruction side. Do the actual operation, compare A and B and set flags or load or whatever it's going to be, and then put results somewhere. So there's, you know, four to six steps depending on the processor. Um, and you can do them all in uh, uh, one per clock cycle, um, but at different clock cycles. So where's my overlap? Here we go. So in this little tiny model here, I see um, you know, an add of 16 into some register and a compare RIX another register with zero. Okay, so these two instructions are pipeline down below. They take four clocks each, but they're running overlapped. And because they're running overlapped, it looks like they're coming out at one per clock. So it allows a higher clock rate because I don't have to do so much work. I don't have to do all four clocks worth of, uh, of work in one big fat clock, which would have a lot of transistor delays. So instead, I'm running my clock at four times the speed, and things are pipelined one after another, just like 
a water pipe has water flowing end to end, and there's some at each level and a stage in a pipe. Found in all modern CPUs, it's just an easy thing to do. Pipelining improves your throughput, but not your latency. And the deeper the pipeline, the higher the theoretical cycles per instruction, right? Um, and, and then this just works great until you have what's called a pipeline stall. And you know, in theory, you can get everything down to one clock per pipe. But in practice, some instructions just do not pipeline well. And at that point, you get a pipeline stall. Um, you, you can also stall if you ran out of resources. Load store units are very complicated. There's, they get big and fat, and so you don't have too many of them. And if you want to have lots of load store ops flowing through your pipes and you only have one load store unit, you might get bottlenecked on how fast you can do those. You might have branch misses where you have mispredicted, and then your pipeline is full of instructions that no longer count. And this is exactly what happens with Spectre and Meltdown. Um, and in that case, you have to flush the pipeline and restart, and all the work you did so far in that pipeline is thrown away. And the deeper the pipeline, the more work you throw away. So there is a, a, a limit to how much you can get out of pipelining. Caches and loads. So, so the, as mentioned, some other talks uh, floating around, caches have a very wide, they, they cover very wide range in performance. So typically a cache layer runs at a certain speed and the next layer down cache is 10 times larger and 10 times slower. So modern x86 has got three cache layers, but they've been, I've worked on them from zero to three. Uh, caching layers, and, and roughly speaking, it's 10 times uh, slower and 10 times larger as you go down. Um, but the CPU is much faster and wants to run with the fastest possible cache. And what it means is when you go to load a value, if it's not in your cache, you're 100 to 1,000 times slower than if it is in your cache. So any individual load instruction from the hardware's point of view has this huge dynamic range of performance. It's one clock cycle, it's a thousand clock cycles. What the hell, right? Or in a 300 or 400 or something. It's a very large range. So you, you have to you know, understand there's this large variability. Caches try very hard. They get really good hit rates on average for most average programs. You can have programs for which the cache miss rate is tremendous. It misses always or misses never. And this can give you a thousand X difference in speed, which is big enough to really care, right? Um, so with, along with caches, there's a bunch of behaviors about what happens when what you're looking for isn't in cache. And this makes a, you know, substantial differences in performance. Um, the very simplest CPUs will stall uh, until a value is ready from cache. And this would be true of, say, all the earlier generations of GPUs and maybe some of the, uh, there, there are some GPUs that still do this. Um, it's complicated to do something other than just wait for the value. Because if you don't wait for the value and you carry on, um, you don't have the value to carry on with. Uh, um, but commonly, because you might miss in a cache, and that might be very slow, you do want to carry on. And so if you do carry on, you, you can do other instructions as long as they're not using uh, uh, the value you're looking for. So you can hit everything in the dot, dot, dot until somebody says, oh, I need the value in RIX to see if it's zero or not. I'm doing a null check. But I, I did some other stuff, but now I'm stuck waiting on the null check, right? And so the load store unit is typically tied up during the dot, dot, dot piece because it's holding on to the notion of, I went to ask memory for this REX value, and uh, it's not come back yet. And that's holding on to that notion. Like, I'm pending the address of RBX plus 16 into REX. And as soon as instruction says, hey, I want REX, there's another flag somewhere in the hardware that says REX is not available. Now we stop. Um, and so this lets you get a little further along, and it's actually fairly common still in, in many embedded CPUs. So if you don't have the flags from the compare that didn't happen because you didn't get REX loaded, and then you want to jump on that, what happens? So a common technique is to branch predict. You make a guess, you predict, right? Okay, and if you get it right, you, you, you win, and if you get it wrong, you mispredicted and you have to clean up. Right? And so if you're getting it right most of the time, most of the time you win. So the, 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 as long as the win rate is high enough, it's useful to predict, and then you have to deal with the cleanup if you failed. Um, it, many of the branches that actually execute in real hardware are in fact highly predictable. So null checks in Java typically do not fail. Range checks for array bounds checks typically do not fail. 
people don't write programs where they throw no pointer exception on purpose. It's just, it's not a common idiom, right? So you, you discover that these branches are right 90, 95% of the time. And so much of the time you can say, hey, let's go start that next instruction if we can. Um, but we have to like hang on in case the branch does fail. So we don't know until REX comes back from memory, might be a couple hundred clock cycles. And then we do the compare and then we do the test. And then we can see whether or not our prediction was correct. But it'd be great if we can look at these next instructions and do something while we're waiting on that cache miss to come back. OK, uh, multiple issue. And this would, be, this would be the case where you say, in one clock cycle, I'm going to issue more than one instruction as long as the instructions are unrelated to each other. And it turns out, uh, you know, in common coding idioms, you can have a couple of instructions side by side by side. They're all unrelated. It's pretty easy to do. The compilers all try to generate code that works that way because it works with multiple issue. Um, it's subject to all the same constraints we had before. You have to have enough load store units or adders or multipliers or whatever you're using. Um, but then because we're throwing transistors because we can't make them go faster, we have more, you make duplicate load store units and duplicate multipliers and adders. It's in order to do this wide issue thing. So in this little snippet here, um, I have two unrelated instructions. I'm adding to some base address, and I'm comparing some other thing. And they could be wide issued or, or dual issued. They, they, they were using unrelated resources, unrelated registers. Uh, uh, I might need two adders or two ALUs, one to do the compare and one to do the add. But those are cheap, and I just replicate and have two of them. Um, very common, not found on simplest like GPUs and some of the really cheapo, you get little little chips for things that are that won't have it. However, there is this great synergy of mixing branch prediction, speculation, and register renaming. Okay, what's register renaming? That's where during the speculative part, you've you've gone to a branch you had to predict on and you're into the instructions that you don't know yet if they're going to pass or not, going to actually run. You put all their results in renamed registers, extra registers that are not visible at the architected machine state, that if you love the results in the end because the prediction worked, you rename them to the official registers. And if you don't like them, you rename them to junk to, re to reuse them. They're thrown away. So it's a temporary holding space. And a modern x86, everyone knows it has 16 registers plus a bunch of you know floating point op registers or whatever. Actually, under the hood, it's got like 128 registers. And, and most of them are for register renaming purposes. And so it can have things going on on the official 16 registers and another 100 things going on that are all speculative under the hopes that all the branches it's predicted through all pass out great. And if they don't, it'll have to throw it away. Um, and in particular here, the, the main goal of all this fun stuff now is to get to the next cash miss to get it started. Right? If all your time is spent waiting on cache misses, they're, they're the slow things. You want to get the next one going, so you overlap as many cache misses as you can. OK, so I'm going to run through a dispatch example here, uh, and we'll, we'll watch this stuff in action. So I'm going to load from my you know, base address plus 16 here to get a value, um, but I'm going to assume it misses in my cache. And it's going to be 300 cycles to main memory. And I have a you know, four wide x86 issue at 300 clocks on a miss. That's 1,200 issue cycles I would throw away if I stalled right here. But I'm an x86. I'm smart. I don't stall. I'm going to wide issue totally unrelated instruction. I'm going to add 16 to the base. I'm obviously bumping through some array, loading pointers as I go. And I want to null check this value, but I don't have it yet. So I don't know what its value is. I can't compute the flags for the null check. But I can go to the next instruction, and I cannot tell you which way the branch goes, because I don't have the flags. But I can predict on it. And in the past, when I've come to this instruction, it hasn't failed. So I'm going to assume it's not going to fail. I'm going to carry on. And this, so this is clock 0 at the bottom. Um, and instruction three there, and I ran out of my four wide dispatch. That was the instruction decoder saying I took a big old slab of memory and I broke it out into four instructions plus all the registers and fed them to all the different units. But I only had space in that decoder to handle up to four instructions at a shot. So I go to the next instruction. Here I want to store something into where I just loaded from. I'm replacing the null I loaded from memory with the new value. Um, it has to be speculative because the branch hasn't returned yet. So I can't actually execute the store. So I throw it in a store buffer, a common piece of hardware to delay writes 
uh, in, in case they're going to get thrown away, but also to delay writes because memory is slow and I can hold on to the state of the store for future loads on the same address and the same CPU. And after a while, the store will get pushed into memory and that's, you know, that's when it'll show up for other processors, other CPUs. Um, but this current CPU can just charge full speed ahead after issuing any store. Um, and if he, if he happens to load what he just stored, he'll get it out of his store buffer. Um, I have another instruction here. This one is unrelated cache miss, and this is the key thing I'm looking for. I can now start a second cache miss. Memory's slow, it's still 300 clocks, but this one is starting only two clock cycles after the first one. And finally, I get to a use of a value that I can't speculate around. I can't issue the next address until I have the first address. I'm following a linked list, and I'm just like stuck here now. So let me roll through a summary. In about four clock cycles, I started two cache misses. They'll return in clock cycles 300 and 302. So I did seven ops in 302 cycles, entirely dominated by cache misses. And this is the common performance model of a modern CPU. You are entirely dominated by cache misses. Um, I'm going to talk about Itanium only because it was an interesting effort. Intel poured billions of dollars into doing static instruction level parallelism instead of dynamic. Because they read some early papers on what's the possible performance speedups on so-called infinite machines, machines with infinite registers, infinite speculation, infinite cache misses, and so on. And they tried really, really hard. Um, they ran into all kinds of weird issues, uh, limits of compiler knowledge, limits of encoding, instruction encoding. There were some class of apps that worked pretty well on, and mostly on all your desktop. Anything you show up on a cell phone, it sucked. It did not work at all. Um, and they burned billions of dollars and kind of there is a lesson learned there that the, the dynamic ILP is sort of the way to go. The, the deep pipelining, the ever wider issue, the parallel dispatch and all that kind of stuff, um, there is a limit. We've hit it now. We've hit it for a while. But the static versions where you sort of pre-compute everything using the compiler technology could not do it. Um, even with all the hardware support that a billion dollars will buy you. So you still have this issue where a miss rate of 5% will totally dominate your performance. And that'll show up in a few slides down the road when I talk about you know, what to do for performance in, in modern code, you're writing stuff. There are patterns people typically use that uh, totally hammer on this the wrong way, and, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. So pretty much um, instruction level parallelism is mined out these days. Uh, there's no point in adding more transistors there uh, because you're not going to get any more uh, overlapping execution of things. Um, people tried really hard and didn't go anywhere. So, uh, uh, you know, people turned directions, you know, GPUs kept marching forward. Um, NVIDIA will sell you things with thousands and tens of thousands of CPUs. Um, it's a more narrow problem domain, and, and, and the one of the reasons NVIDIA is all excited about deep learning, it's another problem domain other than gaming for all those GPUs. That's a serious problem domain there. Okay, so now we go dive into what all those caches mean to data races because that impacts Java programmers doing parallel programming on a regular basis. So we're going to look at a data race in detail here. So we have the, the classic memory versus CPU speed. This went on for 20, 30, 40 years, something ridiculous. Um, it, it, it didn't really slow down all that much. The, C, the, the CPUs got better at accessing memory, but memory didn't really get a whole lot faster. It did get a lot wider, and that goes to the same theme that I've mentioned before. You get more bandwidth, but not more latency. And as long as you don't hit those cache misses, you're all good. And as long as you can prefetch and pipeline, you know, bandwidth works, and otherwise it doesn't help. You're same speed. Okay, why, why is there this difference in speed between on-chip and off-chip? Because the off-chip stuff, it has to be done with a different technology to get the density. It's DRAM instead of SRAM. SRAMs are done in the same process technology as processors because it's on the same die. They use six transistors per bit. They burn a whole hell of a lot of power, and they run really fast. And that's your L1, your L2. Your L3, some people go DRAM in a processor technology, and some people do it with a smaller SRAM, kind of varies. 
off chip, those, those chips are always DRAM. And the DRAM has one transistor and a capacitor. And when you read it, you drain the capacitor out and you have to reset it to fill the, the one bit you read out. And if you read a zero, you don't have to reset it. Um, the capacitor leaks because it's so tiny. And because it leaks, it drains out slowly and eventually it'll vanish and you'll hold no power. So when you turn the power off on a DRAM, of course, it loses everything. It has no memory in that sense. But also it loses it over time and so it has to be refreshed. So DRAM slower in another way. Uh, periodically it's unavailable, it's inaccessible because the memory chip has to read every bit and refill all the capacitors before they drain away. But you got a lot more density out of it, hugely more density. And the DDR2, DDR3, 4, 5, um, those were all uh, various kinds of, of bandwidth improvements mostly. There was some latency improvements, some uh, uh, technology and how you talk over the wires to get speed out, but mostly you got bandwidth. Okay, why do caches work? Because you, programs exhibit locality in space and time. And because they exhibit locality, you can reuse something that happened recently or nearby. And so a cache line is a, a set of bytes in a row and it's read from memory uh, 128 bytes at a shot or whatever the number happens to be on this technology. And that's a locality thing. If I read nearby bytes and I've read them once already, then I've got them in my fast cache and it's good. Um, Space, uh, uh, time locality is simply, I read something, I might read it again. And that happens all the time, it's very common. So you move it to the closer to the CPU to use it the fast L1, L2 caches. Um, so we have this layer of caches here where I have main memory at 300 clocks away. There's some L3, which is shared amongst multiple cores. Uh, and I'll just show one extra core here. There's an L2, which is private for the one core. Maybe it's 10 to 15 clocks. There's an L1 D cache and an L1 I cache. They're split because the instructions are typically not modified. Um, and then there's the CPU core. And the L1's still like three clocks away from the CPU's point of view. So we'll share at the L3 cache layer down there and we'll, we'll uh, uh, and have main memory just beyond that. Okay, um, I kind of covered this already. Memory is actually slow enough. It looks like disk, you know, it's like 10x, 100x slower than what goes on in your registers here. So we're trying to make this memory go faster to, to you know, speed things up. So we're gonna relax coherency constraints. What the hell does that mean? It means that you're not going to do the obvious thing. You're gonna take all the shortcuts you can with an effort to improve your, your throughput, but actually mo commonly improves your latency as well, except occasionally it does not. But you get a more complicated programming model, which is mostly hidden from most programmers these days if you're in Java land, because the Java memory model covers it. But if you're in C code, you have to understand what the hell is going on here, um, because you'll run straight into it. Uh, and, and the things you run into will be stale reads, out of order reads, uh, the order of reading will be relative to the observing CPU. It's just like Einstein relativity. Um, things will be happening in multiple places and it'll be all relative. So let's go step through an example here. I've got two CPUs. There's two sets of caches, one for each one. I only have one L1 cache in this little tiny model and I got a main memory down below, right? So in reality, of course, the caches are a lot bigger and a lot more complicated than I'm showing. Data is replicated. You see flag on one side and flag in memory. Data on the other side, data in memory. It's in two places. It's once in my fast cache and once in my slow memory, right? Now the RAM itself is not this black box that just takes addresses and returns values. It's a very complicated thing under the hood. It's trying to optimize itself as best it can. Um, it's a best effort. It's definitely not first in, first out. Uh, so it's you know best throughput kind of model. And, and that means that you can expect unexpected behaviors out of the, the, the main memory itself. Between the caches, there's a minimal line, uh, hardware lines going back and forth to support a protocol. I'm showing a very simple protocol, modified, exclusive, shared, and valid. Uh, modern hardware uses a much more complicated protocols. So I'm not gonna go into it here. But the point of this protocol is it lets me mostly kind of sorta act like the caches represent all of memory, even though there's another CPU right next to me that also thinks it owns all of memory and we're reading and writing and it mostly kind of sorta works. Um, and where it doesn't, you get a data race. And this is exactly what we're gonna look at here. So here's a little piece of Java code where one thread is trying to read a value and another thread's trying to initialize it. 
And so there's a flag that says the data is ready or not. This is a classic singleton uh, uh, initializer pattern where you write a singleton and you set it. It's a it's the singleton is ready flag, right? And the other processor tests the flag, and I don't have a volatile on it. And so he if he sees the flag set, he wants to go get the data, right? So there's no volatile here, so I can get a data race. So let's watch how the data race happens. So his initial values, I got flag, it's set to zero. The data's not ready. The flag's saying it's not ready, and that's what's in memory as well. Um, one processor starts this, hey, is the flag true or false test, right? So he's going to load the address of flag. That's the green stuff at the bottom. And the hardware side, he says, grab RAX as the value for flag. Well, I don't have it, so I go to my cache, and I ask the cache. That's the question mark flag that's floating down right by the cache. Um, well, the cache doesn't have the flag either. So the cache does two things. It says, tell the other guy if he has a copy of flag, he needs to dump it because I want a copy of flag and I'm going to get it from memory, right? And the other guy says, ah, you know, I only have the shared copy of flag. It's, it's what you got in memory is good. So he goes to memory. You know, the CPU, the green one, goes to memory and says, give me flag. Okay, that's probably another clock cycle, two clock cycles later. Um, Memory says, I'm busy. I'll get to flag in a second. I got a lot of things I'm doing right now. Um, I'm working on it. So the, the, the other guy says, OK, what, what the hell do I do? Let me get this straight here. Da, da, da. I'm going to ask the question. Oh, I cut my thing. Yes, there we go. Fine. I'm going to ask the question, You know, if, if I can, go get data. So I'm going to go speculatively execute now, go, go test the flag, that's the jump at the bottom, and go load the data. Well, I don't have the value to test, so I'm going to speculate. I'm going to speculate that I can go get it. So I'm going to go set, fetch my data under the hopes that the flag comes back true. But I don't have the flag yet. I don't know. But I'm going to go ask my memory for the data. And here, the other CPU has said, well, I'm busy writing the data. And I'm going to write flag in a minute, but I'm writing the data first. And he's busy writing the data. And the data is going to go hit his cache, and then from his cache go to memory. And it hasn't done that yet. And the other CPU, the green guy, is saying, give me the value for data. Well, he's going to go to his cache first, and then to memory if he can. And here's the true data race. Two people, want th one's writing it, one's reading it. They're both doing it at the same time. And they're in different physical locations on the chip. There's actual you know, physics here, right? So two different places. Da -da -da, try again. OK. Um, the speculative value for data is returned out of the green guy's cache. He has a copy. It's stale. It hasn't been evicted yet. Um, meanwhile, CPU0, the yellow guy, says, I've got the new value for data. I want to tell the other guy to ditch his copy because I've got the copy, right? But the race is already lost, and the other guy has read the stale value. And then he does this right to his cache. It's flagged as modified. The other guy evicts data out of his cache and reports back to the first guy's cache. I got rid of data. I don't have it anymore. So there's only one modified value of data. There is a value in memory. It's stale. Let's see if I get that there. Yeah, it's in two places. The value is now you know, relative to the observer. If you ask for data from the memory unit, you'll get a 0. You ask for data from the yellow CPU, you'll get 1, 2, 3. You ask for data from the, the green CPU, it's not in his cache. He doesn't have a copy. He's got a value in his register, but it doesn't know where that came from at that point. The register just knows it's got a zero now. And then uh, we, we carry on with flag. So the yellow CPU says, OK, I wrote data. Now I'm going to write flag. And I'm going to tell the guy, get rid of your copy of flag, because I'm going to have the, the proper value for it. And then I'm going to set it to one. And it's modified. I get a report back from the other guy saying, you know, he got rid of his value for flag. I have the value for flag. And I'm sending it down to my, to my memory unit. So the memory unit's already got a write pending in a store buffer somewhere of one, two, three for data. And there's a write pending coming shortly for flag to one. And the whole operation of what the hell is the value of flag for the green CPU in the beginning has not yet been answered. Um, and memory suddenly sees that he's got a write a flag and a request for flag. He hasn't gone to his giant array of bits that he's trying to write things into or read things out of yet. So he turns around and says, I can answer this question now. Here's the value for flag. It's one. And so it goes up to the cache of the green CPU. And it goes up to the main CPU, who then says, prediction was correct. I will now take the zero that I loaded for data and proceed with it. 
And then I'll return my null instead of the actual value, and it's null crash and burn time. So it's an actual data race because in actual life, there are two CPUs, they are physically disjoint, and they are reading and writing the same address at the same time, and due to the cache coherency protocol, it's allowed for that to happen. And what the volatile keyword does is it prevents the write of, uh, uh, the read of flag and the write of data to bypass each other. Um, and, and that's done by asking the CPU to stall until one of the operations is done before proceeding on the next one. And that has to be done on most modern CPUs at some point in there. Okay. Now I think we got enough background. Let's go look at Spectre and Meltdown. Um, both of these techniques use CPU speculation. I'm going to run out of time. I'm just going to talk about Spectre. Um, but they both start from the notion of we're going to use speculative execution to change the non-architecturally visible state, such as caches or branch prediction tables, branch target buffers, whatever it's going to be. And we're going to use the speculation to load the secret data into the caches, and then we're going to read it out of the caches using a standard sort of timing attack. So, um, you know, no, no as planned for security is violated here. The, the chips all do all this speculative execution. Y y every, you know, the last 40 years has been this way, 20 years at least, and they all correctly execute the, you know, the prediction, and if you fail a prediction, you don't get to see the architecture value that was loaded or not loaded behind the prediction. It all works as expected, and then these guys are using this side channel attack of the speculation changes the state of the cache so they can read it out. So let's take a look. So I'm, a, I'm an attacker. I've got some victim met process I'm going to go execute. Um, it could be that I'm a, I'm a JavaScript program coming on a web browser. Uh, I get to look at myself, so I am my own attacker. I'm trying to break the sandbox, right? And I want to get at, say, the crypto key somewhere. So I look for a piece of code that looks something like this. There's pretty much there's a lot of flexibility. So I'm using this pattern here. There's a lot of flexibility in the pattern. Um, it helps to have ARY. Let's see if I get a pointer here. Th that to be a byte array. Because then I only, I'm only loading one byte at a time. I'm going to use one byte at a time. I'm going to steal a byte at a time. I'm going to peek at a, by a secret byte one byte at a time. And I happen to know what the value of buff is. Um, I don't have to actually read buff. I just have to know its, ad its value. I know where the key is. But I can't read the key. It's protected. Every time I read the key, I get told, you know, ah, this, this call to read the key failed. You, you're not allowed to look at the key. But I'm going to go peek at the key because I'm going to go pick an X for this array ad address expression such that it's going to point into the middle of the key. And I want the range check up here to predict pass that there's a test here. I have some branch table down here. It's got some range check, which doesn't actually fail ever hardly at all. So I just run this a few times, and the predictor will say, range check is not failing. OK, I'm going to predict through it if I need to predict through it, right? Then I'm going to prepare my caches. Now, I showed you L1 caches. Um, it, the real ones may be 64 kilobytes in size with 32 byte lines. That means you have 2,000 cache lines. You touch 2,000 addresses one after another in a row, you'll fill up your cache with whatever your junk is. Um, and the cache now contains nothing but the junk that you just loaded. It actually will contain a few other things, but it'll be 99.95% full of just the junk you loaded. In particular, it won't hold any of buff or the array at length. That's what I'm looking for here. I don't want either of those two in. Then I want to get the key, the, the secret byte in the cache. So I go ask the program in question to run a standard uh, crypto check um, just for it touches his, his key. And the key then gets loaded into cache. Now, the address of the key is, whoops, doo -doo -doo, I blew it here, back up, back up. The address of the key is where the cache is saying, I'm holding this address. And the value of the bytes of the, of the crypto key are also in that cache line. So the address is on the left, and the, the, the bytes of interest, the key bits I'm looking for, are on the other side. So let's walk it through. So I go run that piece of code, that Java piece of code, and I do the range check. Well, what's the range check look like? It says, ah, go to the base of the array and you know, grab the length out of it. OK, that's not in my cache. So this misses. So this is the 300 clocks to me in memory. Then compare it against the address I'm going to use. That x was carefully picked to be the address of the key. 
right? Okay, well, that range check will fail, but it hasn't happened yet because I don't have the length. So ooh, go to the next one. Okay, so there's a check for fail. Okay, I have to predict here. And I've tested this already in the hardware and taught it, predicted it won't fail. So the hardware says, hey, hey, I'm going to speculate through. And the next instruction is go load at the, uh, at the value I just predicted through um, to load the magical byte I want to get. So there's the byte I'm trying to grab and register K. That's under speculation. And I had a scale factor of 256 because it's whatever elements are in that second array, however big they are. I didn't have to be 256. I don't care. There's a multiply there. Multiplies are fast relative to cache misses. So those two happen pretty darn quick. And it's all speculative. Um, but I have the actual value for K and R temp in speculative registry named registers. I then do this load. And this load says, go load at the address of the byte in question. Some line in my cache has its address changed to some contents of I don't care what this contents are. My address is changed to be some base value I know and k, which I'm trying to discover, times 256. Now, notice I have k on the value side of the cache. Here we have k on the address side of the cache. And that's the data leak. That's the way Spectre is going to attack. Now I have it on the address side of the cache where I do have control over what happens. Now I just have to go time my cache on the 256 values that k might be. Go ask for a fast value of time, go load at an address of i, which might be the k I'm looking for, go check how fast that was, was it fast or slow? Do that 256, 256 times, one of them will be fast, the rest will be slow. The one that's fast, well, that's k. I have the byte of the crypto key. Repeat for the remaining bits, bytes of the key, I have your key. It's actually fast enough I can do much of the, much of the entire process. They're, they're, they're reporting 10 or 100 kilobytes a second read rates um, out of a process. So you can, you can surf through lots of secrets out of a process here. And it relies entirely on speculative execution. Let me back up here for a second. Da -da -da. Notice that when, when this load returns, this branch will fail, and these instructions will be thrown away. And the register that contains k, that's one of the registry name values, it'll get tossed. This is speculative state all goes. This state will not go when the, when the registry naming fails. And that's where you end up keeping the, the change in the cache, which you can now detect. OK. So that, that's Spectre. Meltdown has a fairly similar initial starting attack mode. Let me talk a little bit about cache misses and performance, and then I'll wrap it up here. So, you know, I started coding a long time ago. Uh, page faults were the dominant thing, and locality within a page fault within a page was what you counted on. <coughs> we went through a phase where memory got big enough that page faults kind of trickled down to we don't care. Um, but loads were cheap because memory was faster than the CPU, and multiplies were expensive. And as time progressed, that got reversed. More transistors got thrown multi at multiplies. They got faster. Loads got expensive because CPUs got faster, and memory did not get as much faster as CPUs did. So the relative ratios kept changing. And now loads are expensive. So locality is critical in your caches. And then you know, update to, to just a couple of years ago is the same as now. Um, you know, you ran out of useful things to do with transistors on one core, so you got lots of cores instead. It's not what we wanted, but it's what we got. So there's a performance model that changes. Used to be you could count instructions. And if you're on very simple either GPUs or embedded systems, that's still true. Um, but these days, cache misses dominate performance. The Java Virtual Machine uh, is very good at eliminating the cost of code abstraction, but not the cost of data abstraction. And that means multiple data indirections mean multiple cache misses. They're very expensive. This is where your performance goes. So you, people remember you know, OS classes and zero copy network stacks, right? Now it's read from Google Protobuf into JSON, into a DOM, into SQL, and whatever. Every time you read that data, it all passes in and out of your caches. And every time you run through these conversion steps, all the data in and out, in and out, and that's where all the time goes. So don't bother converting it if you can. Leave it in the raw state. 
and peek at it unless you have to convert it for speed because peeking at it is too expensive. Like JSON is really hard to peek at in the middle of shit. Um, and then, you know, it has to pay back the cost of conversion. So you, you know, do, do multiple uses if you're going to do it, if you're going to do it at all. Um, I see a lot of people, a lot of code where somebody says, I got something in a sort of a, a not so convenient format, and they do an immediate conversion to some other format, do something trivial, and convert it back. And, and that's where the performance goes. So I, I'll easily get two to four X speed ups on anyone's code, sort of just casually by staring at what they're doing end to end, look at the conversions where they do all the data gets converted all the time, and, and removing them, and figuring out how to do it without doing conversions. Uh, same story on caches. They're expensive, and they have this fancy, complicated protocol. The protocol totally supports parallel reads and mixed one reader, uh, one writer, many readers, but not multiple writers. So immutable data is very much slower. And so immutability is a conveniently good, fast technique for writing uh, high-throughput parallel code. It doesn't always work. You can't always use it. But when you can, it's an easy, fast, good way to write parallel code. Just to think about how you can write something once and not write it again, and all the readers can just read it freely. Um, chip multi-threading, that's the hyper-threading on Intel CPUs. Um, they have some things they run uh, in parallel and with multiple uh, uh, hardware units, and some things are shared. Um, it's commonly that the complicated things like memory load store units are shared. And so, uh, if you have no misses, you don't get the speed up that you want because you don't have enough CPU, enough clocks. I get this wrong here. <laughs> the, the, the big floating point units are commonly shared because they're not commonly used. So if you're running, say, neural net hardware on your x86, then the hyper threading may not help as much as you'd like because there's only one set of, of floating point multipliers and they're fully saturated by you know, one or two cores and not the, the second hyperthread doesn't use it. If you have a lot of cache misses, you get a benefit because you get to have a second unrelated process run its cache misses in parallel with your cache misses, and so you get to get more bandwidth out. Um, you get some speed ups that way. It, it is an interesting thing. It's not, as, it's not a straight up speed up as you might like. And one of the key points out of this is cache misses are hard to spot in profilers. If you have a hardware profiler or you're reading hardware performance counters, they show up. If you're looking at, I want to say your kit, but not just to point fingers at your kit. If you're looking at sort of the Java stack level uh, kind of profiling and you're out of your cache constantly, it'll only look like your code is slow and kind of smeared out everything is slow. And it's really hard to tell that the failure mode is you're out of your cache, probably because you're copying the data constantly. Right? So out of cache is hard to spot in most profilers. You need hardware performance counters to say that I'm running out of cache constantly. Da -da -da. OK. Um, yeah, CPUs. They, they give the illusion of simplicity. Same as Java virtual machine gives the illusion of this very simple Java thing. And under the hood, it's really, really complicated. Lots of moving parts, all running in parallel. Um, you know, performance models have not changed since the last five or six years. They've basically stalled. You're going to get more CPUs. You're probably going to get more memory bandwidth, but you're not going to get a lot of actual raw CPU performance. And, you know, performance analysis is rarely an armchair game anymore. It hasn't been that way for a while. If, you, if things aren't running as fast as you want and you want to know what's going on, playing the guessing game probably will have you guess wrong. Use a profiler and actually reach for the hardware performance counter profilers uh, pretty shortly. You know, if you use the your kit like thing and you do the obvious stuff and you get some speed up and you want more, reach for a hardware counter and see if the issue you're running into is you're out of out of cache. Da -da -da. And that's it. And actually I should add Spectre and Meltdown there. But that's it. Done. <laughs>